Alton Senna was a man who inhabited two very different worlds. As one of the greatest racing drivers ever seen, his environment for nine months of the year was the intensely competitive arena of Formula One. But as winter descended in Europe, Senna was able to enter his other world, back home in his beloved Brazil. At his retreat in Angra dos Reis, he was able to unburden himself of the pressures of Grand Prix racing. This film, made at the end of the 1990 season after he had taken his second world championship, gives us a privileged view of Senna, the private individual, rather than Senna, the racing driver. Whilst the Brazilian had the opportunity to relax, it did not mean that he forgot any of his dedication and single-mindedness. Early in his F1 career, he had learnt the value of fitness, and the beach resort gave him the ideal base from which to work on the stamina that would serve him through the next season. This pair of tennis shoes have done probably... They are only about over two months old. Almost finished. A lot of running. I've been doing, I've been doing 12, 15, 20 kilometers a day. Uh, three days, one day stop, three days, one day stop. Behind it, the motivation is that I know not only for my profession is important, but also for my health. It's a responsibility I have even if I am on holiday that I must keep uh, very close and very much under control because uh, it will make a difference when I go back to the racing car, to the tracks and testing or racing. Uh, I'll be in a better shape, I'll drive better, I will perform better. And um, it's the motivation behind. It's important to keep very strong so it gives you the, the, the right feelings for doing it. Sometimes he was happy to run on the beach and use the soft sand as an extra training aid. But often he would take the boat out to a less scenic location, an oil jetty about a mile offshore. The need for precision in everything that he did was even reflected in his choice of running track. The jetty was exactly one and a half kilometers long and it provided a consistent surface, allowing him to compare different training sessions in his constant quest to improve. Are you competitive by nature? You seem to me to be very easy going, very charming. Do you save it entirely uh -huh. for racing? I am very competitive. I think uh, any racing driver that um, gets to Formula One has in its personality a lot of competitiveness. Um, I particularly believe to be extremely competitive in anything I do. Um, but uh, it depends where you are and what you're doing, what is your state of mind. If I'm on holiday, off season, um, it's a different way of living totally then when you do interviews when you testing during the season racing competing during the season you have to allow yourself um, a different mental approach a different way of looking the day and night and and only that way i find possible to get the necessary equilibrium to then give everything i have when it really matters but in, in normal things, I am competitive. I like to compete and I like to, to do well. I like to be the best. Once each running session was over, there was a brief chance to cool down, but more training would follow back at the beach. You can drive a Grand Prix car, whether you are fit or unfit, but for how long you can drive, how precise, how consistent you can drive under stress, under high temperatures and uh, difficult conditions in, during race is another thing. You know that's going to be tough, 
you're gonna feel tired, you're gonna have some pain, you're gonna lose a lot of liquid, but you know you can do it. As good as anybody, if not better, if you are well trained, well fit. So if you are not fit, your concentration just tends to go gradually away during a race distance. So the summertime in Brazil was a chance to recharge his batteries and re-energize his body. A tiring season of incessant travelling, testing and racing could be put behind him and he was able to focus on building his strength for the approaching year. His friends looked on as the maestro put himself through a rigorous fitness regime. But with all those calories being burned off, there was, of course, one great advantage. Ayrton, can you eat what you like? Pretty much. Not only what I like, but as much as I like to, as much as I want to. Um, I don't normally have a problem with uh, any kind of food. Of course, I try to eat um, healthy food. I love fruits in general. I like um, also typical Brazilian type of food like rice, beans, uh, potatoes, salad. Um, but uh, I avoid red meat now for a few years. I cut it slowly. But when I'm in Brazil, I eat a little bit from time to time. I eat a lot of fish, particularly when I am in the beach house. After seven years as a Formula One driver, Senna had all the benefits that went with the job. His own private helicopter was the ideal tool for a guided tour of his home city of Sao Paulo. The huge commercial and industrial centre of Brazil, one of the largest cities in the world, was his birthplace and the location of his new offices. This is the centre, the business centre of Sao Paulo. It's a big avenue with all the banks and everything. All the big, and, uh, big, and the centre, the big centre, a lot of things going on. Protect our water lugar. This is Plaza da Sé. It's the beginning of Sao Paulo. It's the Marco Zero. So tell me, what is this building, Arton? It's my new office. It's going to be my new office. And the top of it is especially being built for a helicopter landing pad for us. We have three levels of the building just for my our activities. Here is, is where I keep my, my private jet, which I fly all over the world. Uh, the twin jet, it's a uh, HS-125-800, made by British Aerospace. By the sign leader is where I keep my jet. Now we're coming up to the surface, Interlagos, where we come now to race the Brazilian Grand Prix. It has gone through major rebuilding last year. And we had the Grand Prix back in Sao Paulo, before it used to be Rio. Now it's just, as you can see, some, still, some work still going on, just before we, the race uh, in March. Beside the racing circuit, there is the go-kart circuit, which is where I start racing 15 years ago. That's the go-kart circuit there, beside the main street. Back in 73, I did my first official race, which I won. I actually won the race. The circuit is over there, on our left, where I used to run, where I do my training. This is a university area, it's only for the students. And they have this club for exercise and, and fun and, 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 and all kinds of sports activities. And, uh, it's a place for only young people, it's good atmosphere, good mind, which is important, especially when you're doing hard, hard training, to have a good atmosphere, a good uh, positive attitude towards to your exercise, your training program. Above the suburbs, Ayrton showed off his parents' house, where he had lived for 15 years. We built the house from zero. Your people in Sao Paulo know you live here. Some. 
Sam. And now if he goes away, you see the mountain. Senna was not the only driver to make it big on the Grand Prix scene, having come from Brazil. Emerson Fittipaldi was in the vanguard, winning two world titles in the early 70s. Ayrton felt that Brazilian drivers did have some advantages. I believe when somebody 10, 12,000 kilometers away decides to go to Europe from South America, from Brazil, um, you, you must have in yourself a lot of guts and a lot of um, determination to succeed. I think that is a common feeling in all of us. If we have less technology around us that can do part of the job for us. We have to create much more. We have to innovate much more from our own source. We are still very young. We are still disorganized, generally speaking. And therefore we have much more problems to do things and to achieve things. And when we decide to go for it and compete, we have a, in our instincts, I think, a little bit more power uh, to go through difficulties and to create a little bit more in, in situations where it is the ability you have to imagine and create and put it in, in reality. Maybe we have a little bit more. With the money to do as he pleased and go anywhere he wanted to, in fact, Senna was happiest spending time with family and close friends and enjoying natural surroundings, such as the family farm situated around 160 kilometres away from Sao Paulo. Mechanical toys were never far away, but his love of nature and of the countryside was very evident. Were these lakes here before? There were originally two lakes. This one was the higher one. Um, and we decided to join them. And we made one big lake, which is over one kilometer long. The water is a natural water, it's spring water. There is no outside water, it's completely clean. So it's, it's beautiful to water ski, jet ski, swim, and just play water sports, which I love. And we also, are uh, planning to put some fish here, 15, 20,000, uh, to then be able to also to fish a little bit and have a fresh fish, the ones we like most, and uh, have fun. Now, over here, w what are these buildings I see here? Well, they, they were not in the farm when we bought, and then part of our development program, we decided to build those, those houses, for the workers. And so we have built so far about 10 houses and the people who then work for us can have a good way of life. Uh, and also uh, it's, it's nice to see new things done properly with the right shape, right design, right style. We are also making uh, the main house for us. It's gonna have 10 suites they'll be facing the lakes and we have a swimming pool down here and then we have the main house which is automatically connect with the suites over there with the saloons and and all the all the, the other things that we we like to have in a private house we've been working here for a year and a half already and i believe we have another two years to go um, everything is facing uh, the two lakes, uh, so all the time our view will be the two lakes. We have a tennis court right in front, the swimming pool, we have the boat house there on the left, and, uh, and we try to preserve the, the, the trees that were here from the beginning to have um, the atmosphere, the environment as untouchable as possible. So it's going to be nice when it's finished. This is our pier that will link 
the house. You have stairs going up there uh, that go on the terrace. And that house is the boat house where we have the entrance. The water will go, actually goes into the house. So the boat go into the house, the jet skis, and we have a crane there to pull the jet ski out of the water and put it over a, a special place. I have there also a place for the go-karts, a place for the boat, a place for the radio control model aircraft. So it's a place only for fun. All the hobbies I like to play all the time. And I can play here on the farm in many different ways. Uh, are all concentrated in there. So um, I will be spending a lot of my time there with my friends and my cousin and the people who like the same hobbies. His concern for the natural order of things was clear in his approach to the farming methods used on the estate, where an organic system of agriculture was used. You've got a lot of stuff growing here, Alton. Yeah, this is just a small corn plantation that we have for our own need, for our own consumption. And uh, we use not only for us to eat, but also for the cows, you can see here. It's still premature, but uh, it's uh, our own corn. We know chemicals or anything else that can be bad for your health. See here, mm. the corn, right? That's <laughs> terrific. It's natural, no chemicals. So, okay, here we are with the uh, orange trees, one year old orange tree and you can see still very green it's not the the season but it's full of fruits already and again it's our own you can come and grab from here and eat immediately uh, with no chemicals or anything else this is just for everybody on the estate yes it's just for our own use uh, for my family my friends and also the people who live here in the farm we have oranges we have tangerines we have lemons we have bananas over there, we have the corn, we have rice, we have lots of fruits and uh, it's only for our own consumption. Why are you pulling this poor tree out? Because it's mandioc tree and it's the way to get the stuff out so you can have a nice and fresh vegetable. Okay, this is it. Here is the mandioc, all the way. And you, you, but you, now you've destroyed the tree. How long before you get any more manioc? It's about six months you get a new one. It grows very fast and is, is the way to have this agriculture. Ayrton's father did not like cameras. <laughs> he was a shy man, but hugely influential. <laughs> you got him. Yeah, we got him. But tell me what you think you got from your family and your upbringing. I think, first of all, a lot of love. I think this is important in human, human being. And um, I happened to have a lot when I was a kid from my family, and uh, that gave me all the strength I have in my education, my personality. Um, of course, I had all the support from my family in everything I, I've been involved. I've been always followed very close by my parents particularly. And although I had freedom to choose things, anytime, whenever I, I was going out of line of what is a healthy and a good way to live, they were right there to, to show me, to explain me what was going on and what was gonna happen later, which then you have no idea and they were trying to prevent major disasters, let's say. And yet I was able to, to do wrong things and learn by doing it, which is sometimes the best way of learning, by mistaking yourself. And I think I'm very fortunate because um, my father and mother gave me the fundamental feelings that uh, I have until today. Uh, together with that, of course, um, I have a, a wonderful sister and a very special brother and um, we always live very close together, always 
doing things together, always thinking as a group, as a whole, always being positive about things. We always had a healthy life. We always had um, anything we want in life. Um, so in that aspect, I think I had, um, I'm a fortune guy. The estate was situated near Tatui, and there were a variety of ways by which his friends arrived, sometimes by bus, sometimes by plane, either to discuss business or just shoot the breeze. Despite not having kids of his own, he enjoyed having them around, and they, in turn, loved the sort of motorised machinery he had at his disposal. At a Grand Prix, Senna could appear aloof and impersonal, but in the company of trusted friends, he was relaxed and casual. The local estate agent was trying to sell off more land, and he added weight to some good-natured banter. Another advantage of the space at Does Lagos was the ability to build his very own kart track, a track to share with friends and racers keen to develop the techniques required to perhaps follow in his footsteps or simply to have some fun. His lack of pretension and very easy manner with everyone involved was again typical of the man when on home territory and not under the media spotlight. Karting had marked the beginning of his own brilliant career and he was happy to lend a hand, offer advice and join in the atmosphere that felt so familiar. When this film was made, the kart track had only recently been completed and Senna was having his first hands-on experience with a kart for several years. A specially prepared machine was given the usual Senna inspection before he got ready to climb aboard and give it a run. The Formula One overalls and bright yellow helmet were recognised all over the world, but not often seen getting behind the wheel of a machine with less than one twentieth of the power of a Grand Prix car. But the years of separation from his first love became insignificant as soon as he was on track. Indeed. He was soon analysing areas for improvement. Fun, but they go too fast for me. <laughs> the they can't the, win. The, no, no way. They push very hard. They go very. They go pretty fast. Uh, they have also their. Their engines really going well. They pull very strong. That's fun. I'm going to try some other go-karts, see if I find a better one. <laughs> the advantage of being a world champion and owning the track? No one would ever have said no when asked if their cart could be borrowed. 
But in the next moment, he was helping the kids once again, remembering his own debut. When I was eight or nine, I already had a proper go-kart, which was big for me. I was so small and light. So my go-kart was fast. I was so light compared to other people. And I used to run with other people, just playing at weekends. And we were outside Sao Paulo. Suddenly there were so many people playing there with go-karts that they decided to organize a small race. They asked my father if he would allow me to also participate. Because I was eight or nine, there were guys with 20, 25, 18. And my father was a bit scared, of course, and he eventually said OK. And the starting, the grid position, was established by drawing a piece of paper inside the helmet. So they put all the numbers there, grid position, and I was, because I was the little one, they told me, you take the first one, the first one to choose, take the number, and I took number one. So I was on pole position. Uh, and, and that was really my first taste of competition. But it was only a, a game. And I remember I led 35 laps out of 40 because my go-kart was too fast for them. I was big advantage being light. And eventually I was, the last five laps I was second or third. And the guy behind me, who was much faster than me on the corners, could not overtake me on the straight. Eventually he hit me from the back and I went off the circuit and uh, so I didn't finish but uh, it was good fun good uh, good memories back at the farm and it was time to go racing the hero was back on his own cart but had to start at the very back of the grid to give the others a chance it didn't take him long to start picking them off one by one Soon he was giving everybody a masterclass in driving at the limit, something he felt born to do. Despite being the first across the line from his back row starting position, a steward's inquiry was held. Ayrton's father decided he'd been guilty of irresponsible driving. And a new winner was declared, much to everyone's delight. A young lad therefore took a famous victory over a world champion, a day he would probably never forget. Ayrton himself seemed to shake off the disappointment remarkably well and went on to perform an efficient task as master of ceremonies. From one form of relaxation and fun to another, many F1 drivers play golf in their spare time, but the Brazilian had quite a different hobby. Model aircraft were his passion, both the building of the models and the challenge of flying them once constructed. This is from Japan. Ayrton Senna special. There was a friend of mine in Japan who did it. And um, every year, by the Grand Prix time, uh, they make a plane for me, a model. Uh, they are 
from Honda Motor Company. They also have a hobby uh, model flying. And this is the second plane um, they give me in three years. Um, the big one in the wall is the Christian Eagle one. Also was done by them. And the major problem is how to bring all those models to Brazil all the way from Japan. Beautiful. <coughs> His cousin Fabio was also an enthusiast, and the two of them would work and play together. The models were serious pieces of work built with sophisticated materials and requiring great skill to fly. How did you find doing this when you first started? It's very difficult. I've been doing it for five years and uh, I have uh, damaged and broken many, many models. It's a very special hobby. I, I love it. It's relaxing? When you Playing here, yes, when you actually fly, it's not so relaxing because you cannot mistake. You mistake, the model is gone. And sometimes it takes months to build a model. Therefore, you create some love for it because it, you know how hard it is to build one and to damage or destroy one, maybe one second. So, uh, it's some ways it's also a little bit stressing to do it when you fly. But uh, it takes your mind completely away from anything else because it uh, absorbs your mind, your concentration. So it's relaxing in a way to forget any racing cars or interviews, or things like this. <laughs> Flying model aeroplanes is an activity that requires great coordination, total concentration, manual dexterity and excellent vision, all qualities that are required by a top racing driver. So even during his leisure time, Senna was honing qualities he could use as a Grand Prix driver. Puxei e não atendeu. Tá com o corpo comando. Vou passar aqui na frente, pra ela. Nessa posição mesmo, em cima dos carros. Na altura dos carros. Fica aqui, ó. The significant difference to driving a racing car is the lack of feel for what the machinery is doing. No seat of the pants sensations when at the remote controls. It is hand-eye coordination of a high degree, and no more so than when landing. An anxious period for the man who has spent hours building the model. After several years of practice, the perfectionist proved what he could do. <laughs> you, you, you had no, uh, had no engine on that landing? Yeah, 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 the engine stopped on the approach, so I had, uh, it was gliding only. But the plane is... It's, it's marvelous. It flies very beautiful, very smooth. So it's not too difficult to fly uh, compared to other models. Left. Fabio was less experienced and less proficient than Ayrton, but his cousin was on hand to offer words of advice and encouragement. Particularly when it came to the landing. The man who in the Grand Prix environment was seen by some as cold and arrogant showed a very different side to his character when at home in Brazil. But people other than his family would at times have a chance to see beneath the professional persona, 
the students of Loretto School in Scotland, where former world champion Jim Clark had spent his school days, were treated to an insight. Mr Senna is happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Mr Senna, which of your fellow competitors do you admire most and why? One of the greatest drivers of all times is Fangio. Not only because he won five times the world title, uh, but because of his attitude. I had the possibility of meeting with him on different occasions over the past two, three years. He came to some events, some races. I had some moments with him and I, I really like his way of look his way of approaching certain situations, his concepts about life, his ideas about motor racing at this at his time and today. And uh, for me he is not only a, a world champion in the circuit but also a real gentleman outside racing car. <coughs> So for that reason, I, I am a great fan of him and I, I admire him a lot. Sir, how do you personally relate religion to Formula One? Mm. <laughs> I had a very nice experience today when I arrived here in the school because I was taken to the chapel that you all know. <laughs> when you talk about religion, is touching point, very difficult, easy to be misunderstood. But for me it's a fact. It's not only by reading the Bible, where you read black and white, but I try hard as hard as I can to understand uh, life through God. And that means every day of my life. Not only when I am at home, but when I'm doing my work too. Why go on? Because I need it. I need it in first place. It was a kind of uh, um, choice of life. I continuously go further and further, learning about my own limitations, my body limitations, my psychological limitations. And um, it's a way of life for me. Um, Thank you. Of course. There are moments that you wonder how long you should be doing it because there, there are other aspects which are not nice in this lifestyle. But I just love winning. I just love racing. I just love the challenge to beat somebody else. And in many occasions, even to beat myself. But Senna's dream time was the time he spent at the beach villa in Brazil, where he could enjoy the Brazilian summer while winter closed down the racing in Europe. At the end of the 1990 season, he spent 40 uninterrupted days at his retreat, an opportunity to completely refresh mind, soul and body from the demands of F1. And if the weather at Angra dos Reis wasn't quite perfect, he was always able to wind up the helicopter gather some friends and go looking for sunshine somewhere else. A few minutes flying time away from his villa was a large uninhabited island with a ridge of mountains running down its length. On the other side of the mountains, it seemed as though the sun was always shining. Throughout his career as a Formula One driver, Senna remained single. A youthful marriage had not survived his first trips to Europe when he was climbing the motorsport ladder. And he was very aware of the problems. My lifestyle is very particular and therefore makes it very difficult to have um, stable relationships with 
particularly women, because you're traveling too much, you're away too much, especially when you're Brazilian. And uh, when I find the right woman at the right time, it's gonna happen. The island of sunshine was a special place for Ayrton and held some particular memories for him. Well, I come here late in the afternoon. It was a beautiful end of the day. Uh, no cloud, just the sun going down. The beach was completely clean and there wasn't a single footprint in it. And I run, go to the end of it and when I turn, on the way back. I realized that the whole of this was here for me. It was nobody else, nothing else. And uh, it was such a, a feeling of peace suddenly and a, such a strong feeling of healthy that I run harder and harder, stronger and strong. And still I felt so good and uh, I remember I run for an hour in the soft sand which is hard but my vision was so good, was such a good feeling that it kept my butt going. And uh, the, the fact that I, I could only see my, my own footprint as I was going back and forwards was an uh, amazing feeling, like it uh, was a gift. It was a special, special day. From the outside, it looks as if you have a very special life. Does it seem that way to you? I'm sure of it. First of all, few people in life have the opportunity to do what they want to do and to have their profession, what was their hobby. Secondly, to be successful in the activity that we are, very few. To have come from nowhere to where I am today still with 30 years old is it's a great achievement and uh, not only that to be healthy strong and still with a long way to go with so much still to learn and achieve and it's it's very unique to have uh, a good family in the modern days where divorces and things like this are so common uh, so our main problems for sure are that big when you look generally speaking to other people's life and therefore and even so they are big to us because they are the only ones we have so I think I am very fortunate for that I believe the important thing is to be in peace with yourself and to feel that what you're doing and how you're doing where you want to be and how you want to be is clear in your mind and you do your own way. <laughs> 